Hello, I'm Deborah Malone, founder of The Internationalist and host of Internationalist Marketing TV. Today's guest is Kristen Fallon, head of corporate brand and digital marketing for GE Healthcare. Kristen, welcome to the show. I, I know it's been a crazy time for you and so much exciting stuff to talk about, but I am so thrilled to welcome you to the show today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my goodness. What a pleasure. Um, well, look, why, why don't we jump right in? Because you're leading global brand and digital marketing with a mission to ensure that GE Healthcare is the number one preferred med tech brand. And you're also in the midst of executing a successful and historic spinoff. I mean, if that's not daunting enough, I think some of what you've done during COVID to uphold the, the entire GE brand promise of courage and optimism and purpose has just been extraordinary. So why don't we start by you telling us a little about the evolution of a brand with a hundred year old history and also what that means to you right now as a marketer. Mm, yeah, you know, um, most people probably know or may maybe don't, but you know, GE, began over a hundred years ago, um, right around 130 with the light bulb and the power grid. And, you know, these were, imagine at that time, you know, fundamental innovations to modern living. And since then it's, you know, continued to be a global company um, with products that I would say are at the center of human life, you know, lighting, appliances, healthcare, aviation, energy, um, at one point, it entered into, you know, finance, entertainment, you know, GE owned um, NBC. These were all still, you know, aspects at the center of human life. And so the brand has evolved with the times and the industries. Um, and, you know, as a, as a brand marketer, it's just truly an honor to work on a brand with this kind of legacy and heritage. And, you know, you ask anybody who's worked in brand marketing at GE and we'll tell you we're so proud and so protective of this brand. Well, it, it's interesting that you say that because um, my goodness, I was thinking a century of progress, but a, 130 years of progress. Um, what, you're, you're an interesting transition. I'd be curious as to what you see as the brand's enduring values. And I, I know you hinted at that with, with being at the center of human life, but also if, if all that we've been through, if any of those, those values are changing. Mm, yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned a few up front, courage, optimism, being very purposeful. We also know um, through data, and anecdotes that GE's enduring values really are trust, quality, uh, safety, innovation. <clears throat> and that's actually what led us to keep our name. So, you know, GE as a conglomerate is, is breaking up. Um, healthcare will be the first to spin off um, early next year. And we are all keeping the name GE because of those enduring values. At the same time, you know, there's opportunity to sort of shift the brand focus of each company, and, and that's exciting. But, you know, I think what's enduring about the GE brand is not just those values, but also how we bring the brand to life through marketing. And if, if you kind of walk back through history, I think there are very enduring and classic traits in our brand marketing. You know, we tend to be a brand that's very relatable. And you even see this as far back as uh, 1923. So in 1923, BBDO um, put out a magazine ad for GE around the initials of a friend as this brand that everybody knew as a friend. Um, and that really put the GE brand on, on the map in many ways from an advertising perspective. You know, it's, it's a relevant brand. So in the 1950s, uh, Ronald Reagan hosted General Electric Theater TV you know, just at a point in time when TV was really becoming a part of modern life, at least in the US. Um, and so it's, it's been a brand that's been part of our lives. It, actually in the eighties, Andy Warhol created a silk screen of the logo. So you see it sort of at the center, not just of human life, but in many ways of, of culture. And it's, it's a memorable brand. Um, how many people don't know, I guess maybe younger generations don't know, but a lot of, you ask anybody, over the age of 40, they probably know, uh, GE, we bring good things to life. 
that was a slogan that lasted 20 plus years. So, you know, these are enduring and their, their traits, their values, their approaches that we're absolutely taking forward as we, um, you know, prepare to spin off. Now that that's wonderful. Um, and I, I, I can't say I remembered all of them, but certainly GE brings good things to life. I can, I can actually still remember the commercial of the bridge in, in Budapest um, mm. and how it was illuminated and so on. And I remember um, going there and uh, thinking very much of that image. So um, yeah, it is, it is certainly, you know, an indelible part of, of the psyche in, in many ways as, as extraordinary brands are. You said something interesting though. You, you, you talked about um, culture, mm -hmm. you talked about brand, and I, I know you're very much involved with strategy. Mm -hmm. is, what, what, what's the intersection? I mean, this is kind of a, a, a pivotal moment for you, but I also think that as we, as we consider marketing now, those are the three elements of marketing that are really important to driving everything forward internally and externally. So can you talk a little bit about that, the, the interconnection of brand, culture, and strategy? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's such an exciting time for us because we are actually reinventing or modifying all three. So as we prepare to spin off, we are operating along this dynamic and this discussion of what do we keep from GE and bring forward with us? And, and what do we want to change? And that discussion is happening across all three of those points that you mentioned. And you know, if you have, if there are three overlapping circles, right? What you get in the middle, I think, is your identity as a company and your core of who you are and, and how you show up in the world. So, you know. We, we actually are fresh out of um, a leadership summit where we brought together the top 300 leaders to talk about the intersection of these three topics and talk about how we want to activate it. And what is interesting is when you talk about them together and when they actually all fit together, which we worked very hard leading up to this moment to make sure that they did, you it feels so natural, right? And it feels so exciting. And um, I, I think what it means is you're gonna see us showing up differently in the world. For sure, we're still gonna have aspects of the same GE, but how we show up, where we invest, um, what matters to us as a company, you're gonna see that evolve because of these three areas and their intersection. That is fascinating. I, I can't. I can't wait to see that. I, I'm curious, not not to throw a you know a whatever you know a, a wrench in, into this whole discussion, but okay, that's fascinating. I can see that Venn diagram now, mm -hmm. and I can see the three elements we mentioned: brand, culture, and strategy. And and I love that you saw the intersection as identity as being natural and very exciting. Now, now, what about something like purpose? Mm -hmm. Now, is purpose within that? Venn diagram or is purpose something larger that, mm -hmm. that pushes you for? This is because, you know, the discussions of purpose are very interesting and they're evolving quickly as we move from, shall we say, a series of crises, sustained crises, into mm -hmm. perhaps um, some challenging economic waters. I, you know, definitions of things change. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to know how this works for you. You know, we talked about this purpose is our North Star. So it's, um, you know, it is part of the Venn diagram. It is also maybe something more, right? Because it underpins everything about our strategy, everything about our culture. It doesn't just overlap them. Um, and we're, we're about to reveal our new purpose. So I, I can't share it yet. But what I will say is, um, it's, it's bold, it's big, it's ambitious. It, it might even be something that we could never achieve. And, um, and we were very intentional to say something that big and bold and ambitious because we wanna bring our company back to its disruptor roots. And I think language matters and purpose matters. And when you put something that bold as your North Star, then absolutely, it, it underpins your strategy and where you invest. It underpins the type of talent that you hire or the way people feel engaged and motivated to be a part of the company. And so, you know, we're also having a lot of conversations around how this is an amazing opportunity to re-energize our workforce, 
you know, update our employer brand, um, make people more excited to work for us and to, you know, feel a part of this bigger purpose. Oh, no, that that is exciting. And I, I absolutely love um, what you said about going back to your disruptor roots, but maybe more importantly, you know, stating a big, bold purpose that you may never achieve. It's kind of like reaching for the stars. Mm-hmm. You, perhaps, well, maybe a few people can do that. But for most, it, it, it's about the act of reaching mm-hmm. um, as, as opposed and, and what that means, the, how the, the, the getting there is almost equally as important important as arriving, um, which, which I think is fascinating. And, and, you know, obviously you and I are working on a, a chapter on, on, uh, of a book on, that is titled Reaching Beyond Purpose. So I, I don't think we'll, we'll give away any, any secrets yet, but I, I can see um, what, what you're, you're starting to aspire to. Let, let me go to something. Um, I don't mean to say mundane, but something maybe grounded. Um, you've you often use the term brand storytelling, mm-hmm. and I I know that you find this really central to break you know to breaking through today. You talk about purpose matters, language matters, and um, why do you find brand storytelling so relevant? And I, I, I know you did this brilliantly through COVID, but um, th- does in all of this change, is that still one of the underpinnings that matters to you? It absolutely is. And, you know, I think, um, you know, storytelling is one of the oldest and, and most universal um, ways to connect people and concepts. And, you know, I think for brands that want to build long-term relationships, which by the way, is why I love B2B, because we have to, we, if we're going to survive, we have to build those long-term relationships. Um, and so I actually think that gives us more opportunity in many ways to do cool storytelling. But, you know, if, if we want to build those long-term relationships, we know that storytelling allows a brand to engage emotionally. Um, and to imprint, you know, in the memory of our audiences, a message, a concept of feeling, um, and create an emotional bond. You know, there's this whole notion of like the 95-5 rule, right? Which says that only 5% of your customer base is actually interested in buying at any given moment. And I I say that for B2B. Um, But what that means is 95% of your audience is not interested in buying at any given moment. So storytelling is a great way to keep your relationship alive and keep your brand top of mind so that when they are part of the 5%, you're top of mind and and they've already built a connection. Now that that is very interesting. And I I, I think I've heard, uh, there's probably all sorts of ratios out there, particularly Mm. now in a digital world in, in terms of, um, you know, what works. I mean, I think we've come a long way from the John Wanamaker, 50% of my advertising, you know, doesn't work. I just don't know which 50%. But it is extraordinary when when you mention something like 95.5. And, and again, it's 5% in a given moment that are ready to buy. It's probably within that 95%. There, there's a lot of people considering or just not ready to do it and so on, which is why it, it, it is so important to to be relevant. And I, I think that now in a post-COVID, more digital world, um, it seems that marketing has to be responsible for those messages. I mean, it, sadly, it seems that we're seeing a big transition in how in-person selling works and how marketing is taking on a big part of that role mm-hmm. as well in terms of delivering that. Um, I'm I'm just curious um, if if you want to share with us just a little bit about the brand storytelling that you mm-hmm. did during COVID because that that was just extraordinary what you achieved on a daily basis. Just talk a little bit about that to to just make that storytelling a little bit more realistic for people listening. Mm, yeah, so you know we're we're a healthcare company and we we sell a lot of the technology that supports doctors and patients um, during COVID. So 
ventilators being the big one, um, but also ultrasound, x-ray, CTs, monitors. Um, and so COVID was declared a pandemic in March. And I think we were all seeing the news maybe start to emerge December, January, but as a healthcare company selling these products, we actually saw the pandemic hitting much sooner because by January, demand for these products was so high, we actually had to charter planes to create a global loop. So they were flying around the earth, um, delivering you know, parts to some of our factories and then delivering the equipment to where it needed to get to. And we also had to, um, to ramp up our workforce we asked a lot of our desk employees who were located near these manufacturing facilities to come off their desks and work the lines and get trained up. And I mean, talk about purpose and action. People were just so excited to do this and be a part of this. Um, people came out of retirement and we were you know, moving from like certain hour shifts to like full-time work. So we're seeing this amazing story play out. And uh, at the same time, like everybody else, I'm watching the news and, and the narrative was dark and it was scary. And of course it was, it was a very scary time. I mean, who doesn't remember before masks? We didn't even know how COVID was transmitted and that paranoia that you felt. So very scary, but because we had access to a, a, a narrative that was very counter to that and that we felt was also very true in this moment, um, and a narrative that was, you know, optimistic, courageous, the things that our brand stands for, we basically decided if we have access to the news, let's, let's be the news. So we hired a filmmaker. Um, he's ex-military, so a lot of experience in, in tough crisis situations. And um, we put him in a mobile home and sent him around the U.S. So this was March, April. Um, and he became a one-man filmmaking unit. So we had a production crew that was virtual, myself included, and we were able to produce 42 videos in 42 days where he was meeting with people, either our own, so at the manufacturing sites or people um, servicing the equipment or healthcare workers themselves and tell this story. And it became our top performing campaign ever. And we just saw extraordinary results in growth of followers and engagement. And so, you know, this was to your question, a storytelling program that was incredibly relevant and resonant and timely. And what an amazing way to build engagement with your audience. Well, it was timely and, and it was fast. Um, and I think that was one of the things that, that certainly changed in marketing. It, maybe you don't have to make it perfectly polished, but if the message resonates, and as, as you talked before, if you, if you could emotionally engage or imprint something on memory, you know, it's, so, it, it's something that's never forgotten. You, you also said something very interesting. You said, let's be the news. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in an era of, of, of a tremendous amount of content, um, I'd love to know what you mean by that. Yeah, I think because we had, you know, we saw the news reporting one side of the story and because we had access to what we also felt should be reported in the news, you know, we felt we could tell that. And we, the way that we became the news was not only telling the stories, but rolling them out on social media in real time. So 42 videos in 42 days, with a three day turnaround between filming and airing a video with a team of like 10 of us working on it. So it's a small team. Um, and that includes, you know, filming, post-production, legal reviews and airtime. So not live in the sense of news, but what is close I think is a brand could get. No, I, I, I think it's, it's amazing. Um, I, I also think it's amazing at, in a time when there are so many narratives that um, I don't know might be quite personal or, or maybe not as objective as we traditionally had associated with the news, maybe more opinionated and so on. I, I think it's very interesting what you're saying about how a brand can also be the news mm. through, through portraying some of these extraordinary 
situations. And, and it was an extraordinary situation. Um, it's, it's a good point, actually, because, you know, I do think a lot of brand marketers, even through storytelling, right, there's still like a script. There's still a hair and makeup person. There's still multiple takes. There were not multiple takes here. There was no script. There was no hair and makeup. We were pulling people out of their job and saying, hey, will you talk to this filmmaker? And the filmmaker's there because he's a one man, you know, holding his camera out. And um, I think the rawness of that, the authenticity of that struck a chord with people. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I, I think we are now so overloaded that, that for us to believe things, to to ensure that they're genuine, it it there does have to be that element of naturalness to it, or even if it's, as we said, even if it's not perfect, um, and 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 that that is that is really wonderful, um, you know, and and how lucky were you to find this gentleman, you know, mm. to be able to be able to do that. But it certainly sounds like if anyone could could do something like that, it, it was him. Um, so yes. it, it's it's <laughs> wonderful to hear. Uh, let me let me just say something. Um, I, I mean, there's so much more to talk about. And I hope you'll be back when you've got some of these new announcements to make. Um, but again, this is sometimes the time before is also very exciting in terms of the thought process. But what I'd, I'd like to just ask you about on rather a personal level is that most of your career has been at this very interesting intersection of nonprofit and for-profit. You, you often tell the story that when you left school, you turned down a job as a bond trader to join the Peace Corps, which is, which is heartening. And not only did you serve in Benin, West Africa, as a small enterprise developer, but you, you've walked throughout the world in international with international development organizations from NGOs to the World Bank and so on. Um, and you've been involved with everything from startups to major corporations now like GE. So it, it, it's a wonderful personal career history that you have. How has that intersection of the nonprofit and for-profit world kind of informed your your thinking now with with this very important juncture or your thinking about purpose and culture. Um, that 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 would I think be of great interest to all of our listeners. Mm, yeah. I feel so lucky that I have worked across you know three institutions that are really um, at, at the heart of society, right? So nonprofit, government, and business. And I made a very intentional switch um, 10 years into that career of, of working in nonprofit and with government and development to switch to the private sector because, and specifically GE, um, because of what I saw as the ability for businesses to have positive impact on the world. And I think this is a topic people talk about a lot now, but, but it's, it's true and it's always been true. And, you know, I think that um, businesses create employment, they impact people through their supply chain decisions. You know, we, we know this about um, they, the people that they hire, the communities that they work in. Um, so it's not just about the products you sell, but it is also about the products you sell and you can sell products at scale. So that's all been very appealing to me from a business side. And I think what's so exciting for me right now is businesses today are realizing it's not enough to deliver value just for shareholders. And I think you could argue businesses are getting back to their roots. You know, think about the corner store in a small town. That was, you know, part of a town's culture, part of its economy, part of um, what made that, that community flourish. And as businesses have grown, as we've um, industrialized, as we've globalized, maybe we sort of lost touch with that and maybe we're coming back to those roots. And, you know, data shows that employees are happier and more productive. I think that's also pretty intuitive, right? Like we know this and data shows that businesses um, that invest for the long-term viability of people and planet do better. 
I think we also know inherently that that can be true too. And, and I think you see that play out. So, you know, I know there's a lot of debate on this topic and I think that's good. I think we should have that kind of debate, but um, ultimately there's some resetting to do in the business world. And so smart companies um, are updating their growth strategies, are modifying their purposes, because that's what ultimately is going to drive, I think, better impact across um, you know, these broader stakeholder sets. Now you make, you make a very interesting point, um, and I think we're going to only continue to see that um, with um, people opting to live and work remotely, mm -hmm. and maybe their local community suddenly becomes even more important and the kind of things that they can do at the intersection of, of entrepreneurship and, and business and serving communities. So it sounds like there's a lot for us to also follow up on, but I, I, I just appreciate so much your, your giving us these insights and, and the stories are absolutely remarkable. And I, I honestly just can't wait to learn more about this whole process. So we, we very much hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. A pleasure. The Internationalist focuses on the continual reinvention of marketing by highlighting inspirational marketers around the world and their ideas as they move the industry forward. Internationalist Marketing TV shares these perspectives through interviews and personal stories.